Dr. Lawrence, thank you so much for being on the show and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So this is live and you're going to have to bear with me because I'm going to be having to pause from time to time to translate from English to Spanish and back and forth. Sure. So be patient. But I will. what I was telling the audience is that, you know, many of our followers are parents of adolescents. And once I heard something very interesting, try to preserve the relationship with your adolescent child as much as you can. Because when that phase is over, you don't want the relationships to be so destroyed that it's basically impossible to reconstruct. And understanding that it is a phase. So please educate us. Okay. Um, well, I couldn't agree more. And some families go through difficult times during adolescence. Um, but <clears throat> what we do know is that it is a phase. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, um, and um, most teenagers and their parents can maintain a very strong bond, um, as we'll be discussing. Um, that's going to be important not only during adolescence, but as your uh, child becomes an adult. Because you know what? The other day I was talking to a couple of parents, and I've been through the phase of adolescence with my children, and there are five of them, and Definitely, it, it's not easy because it comes a point where as a parent, you lose sight of how to be like you don't know how to be anymore. You don't know what to ask, how to ask it, how to give space, but not so much space that you create a gap between the relationship. And then you forget on how to approach them correctly and in what language and what topics you should speak about for them to be interested and, and, and want to talk to you. So I think that in summary, you forget how to be with them. Well, I have a couple of suggestions. Um, one is to remember what you were like when you were a teenager um, and how, uh, how you would have wanted to be approached and what you might have wanted to talk about. The, the culture changes, of course, um, but adolescents are adolescents. Um, and I, th I think in, in my experience, both as a parent um, and as a scientist and as a teacher, um, the more adult-like you can be w w in, in how you treat your adolescent, um, the better the relationship will be. And I think young people want to feel like they're adults and they almost are. Um, and I think that if you respect your child um, in, in many ways, um, the relationship will be stronger and your child will respect you. Now, let me open another piece of that conversation. So you're saying they're almost adults. So it'd be fantastic if we could treat them like adults. But unfortunately, they don't act like adults, Lauren, so many times. So it's almost impossible to treat them like adults. Right. But people act in ways that they're expected to act. In other words, if you as a parent go into the relationship with your teenager expecting the worst, you will bring out the worst in them. I yeah. think we know this from, uh, you know, as parents, and I certainly know it as a scientist. Um, you, you have to maintain your authority as a parent. And I'm, I'm not suggesting you don't do that, but you can do it in a way that's warm um, and respectful. And we know that that combination of being warm, respectful, and still being a parent, that is having rules, um, is what works during this phase of life. So what I was telling the audience is um, adults tend to feel that adolescence today is not the adolescence in the 1970s or 60s or 80s. And part of what you've done throughout your life is studying and understanding how adolescence has changed throughout generations. So what discoveries do you know that we should know on how adolescents are very different from the ones 20, 30, 40 years ago? Well, I think there are a number of very important social changes that have changed the nature of adolescence. And I think the most important and perhaps the reason that I wrote you and your adult child um, is that adolescence now lasts longer than it ever has before. Um, oh. We used to think of adolescence as ending when people turned 18 and then maybe when they turned 21. But it is taking 
young people uh, longer and longer to move into the roles of adulthood. Um, and that is a change that parents really need to understand. And why do you think that's happened? I think it's happened because of changes in the economy. In most countries, more education is required for a good job than was the case a generation ago, which means that young people stay in school longer, which means that they stay financially dependent on their parents longer. So um, that's one reason adolescence is being prolonged and adulthood is being delayed. Um, a second is that it costs so much more to live these days than it did a generation ago, even adjusting for differences in salaries. Now, I'm not familiar with the statistics from Mexico, but I can tell you that in the United States, the cost of housing has gone up five times um, faster than salaries have. And so young people are much less able to start their own residence, to um, rent an apartment, to buy a home. And more and more of them are living with their parents today than any, any time in recent history. And that mustn't be fun for them either. And we'll go into that. So what I'm saying is, you know, I'm a mother of a 24 year old, of a 27 year old, um, and there's many people in the audience with children in that age ranges. And what I've noticed as a mother with a lot of children that surround me or young adults is that in their 25s and 27s and 30s, they're still like this crisis trying to understand who they are, what to do, if they can be productive. And it's very frustrating for many of them because they cannot become financially independent and that creates, you know, a huge amount of frustration. And on the other side, there is so much opportunity outside of so many things they can do that it's also very confusing. You know, I grew up in the 80s and, you know, you had a couple of possibilities. You didn't like ask yourself twice and you would just do what you needed to do to, you know, start your life. So it is frustrating for them as well. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think that it's fair to say that it's harder to be a young person today Absolutely. Um, than, than it has been um, in the past. Um, and I think we see that uh, really around the world in the rising rates of depression and anxiety among young people. Um, but I want to point out something you said that I think is very, very wise, um, which is that the, the struggle to find one's identity has now been delayed and prolonged. And a lot of young people, even when they're 30, still don't know what they want to do with their lives. But that's one aspect of adolescence that I want to explain to your audience, yes. which is that a lot of the psychological, what should we call them, tasks of adolescence, you know, finding an identity, finding a, a romantic partner, establishing some autonomy from your parents. Those issues used to get resolved when people were in their teen years or maybe their early 20s. When now they're not being resolved until people are in their late 20s or even their 30s. And their parents are very puzzled and perplexed by this, as young people themselves are, right? I mean, I think as a parent, you would think, well, I expected my kid to be married by now, or I expected my kid to, you know, have her own home by now, and she's living with me. And so I think it's, it's, it's a challenging time for both young people and for their parents. Can you explain, uh, Lawrence, how this happened or why this is happening? Is it the amount of opportunities? I remember when um, my younger daughter said to me, you know what, mom, I don't want to go to college. I mean, you didn't go to college and you're super well off. And my answer was, that was the 80s, sweetie. This is 2020 and life is very different. Is it because life is so different? And is it because children or young adults have an amazing array of opportunities in front of them? Or what is it? Well, I, I think it, it is the fact that it's it just takes longer to establish your footing. Um, and one reason, as you note, is that um, there are so many choices to be made. Now, we can look at them, and you use the word opportunities, 
Um, and they are opportunities. But we also know, uh, you know, we've all had the experience of going into the supermarket. And oh, my being, God. And being paralyzed. by No, no, no. Don't, things to don't ask me to from. buy an aspirin because it's almost exactly. impossible. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you go into the dairy section, you used to just be able to go and say, well, do I want whole milk or skim milk? And now you probably have 20 different types of milk to choose from. And just imagine that that's what's going on in terms of um, lifestyle and occupation and education. And, you know, it's no surprise that a lot of young people feel kind of psychologically paralyzed by it. So where I want to go now, Lawrence, is talking about what science has discovered uh, regarding the brain of the young adult and how the brain has changed over these last decades. Sure. Well, we've made tremendous discoveries about brain development um, during adolescence and young adulthood because um, of, of fMRI, you know, the brain imaging technique. When I was doing my training back in the 1970s, um, we were taught that the brain was pretty much finished developing by the time people were 10 or 11. And, and that was because if you looked at the brain, um, you know, just, just looked at it from the external view, um, it looked like an adult brain. I mean, it was as big as an adult brain. Um, but once we had the ability to do brain imaging, we saw that even though it looked like an adult brain on the outside, it was still changing in very dramatic ways on the inside. Um, now, the first research on this, which was really began around the year 2000, focused ma mainly on the teenage years. But in the last couple of, of, of decades, um, scientists have turned their attention to the early 20s. And we now know that the brain is still maturing um, during this phase of life. I mean, some people believe um, maybe as late as 25 years old. So uh, that that has really transformed, I think, the way that we we think about young people, although that information has not been as widely distributed, uh, maybe as it needs to be. So when does the brain stop maturing? When does it reach its full potential? I think there's a little disagreement among neuroscientists about that. Um, I think probably around 23 or so. Some would say not until 25 um, but so uh, let's just generally say like around that point of, of development. Now, the brain is changing after that, but it's not really maturing um, in the way that I think we use that word. Yeah. And is it the same for girls and boys? Well, some of the changes in the brain that take place during adolescence are the result of puberty. You know, I know most people think of puberty as mainly changes in our sexual uh, uh, development and in our physical appearance. But we now know that the same hormones that change how we look change our brain too. And the reason I say this is that girls go through puberty on average about two years earlier than boys. And so their brain development is, um, you know, is a little faster um, in some regions of the brain because of that. But I'd say by the time people are in their mid-20s, there aren't huge differences between the brains of men and women. What is the advice for parents of young kids? Because let me tell you a story. Like every time it's a bunch of parents talking about how we're raising our young adults, there's always somebody telling a story like, when I was 18, my dad sat me down and said, from this point forward, young man, you are on your own. You better get yourself a job, pay for your studies, pay for your books, pay for your life, because I'm not giving you money anymore. And what we say is that that's like basically the best thing that happened to us, because due to that, we became the adults that we were. And I think that's something that we question ourselves a lot about is, are we being too permissive? Are we being too enabling? Are we, um, you know, making it too easy for them? Is it, is it a problem of children not being as hungry as we were when we were growing up? Well, I think that, <laughs> I, 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 you know, in, in what I've written, I, I say to parents that they have to 
um, get rid of the when I was your age mentality. We do um, have to get rid of that, right? I, th I think so. Um, because even though you were you were that that age at some point in time, it was a different world. Then. Yeah. Um, yes. Now, to answer your question about um, whether whether we should view young people as being um, lazy and coddled, um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot, I think a lot depends on the specific child. Um, I do, I do want to say that I think that millennials have gotten a bad rap, mm -hmm. um, in the popular media. And there are some studies that show that their personalities during the early twenties and mid twenties are not that different than their parents' personalities were when they were that age. Um, but I, I, you know, it seems like it just depends so much on the individual child. Yeah. Yes, there are parents who spoil their children and they spoil them as adolescents and young adults. Um, but I think there are also young adults who are trying very hard to become independent and they can't because it, it just takes so long to establish yourself financially. And one of the reasons that I, I try, I, I write the books that I write is that I, I think it's important for each generation to be compassionate toward the other one and yeah. to understand their perspective. I wanted to tell briefly the story of how the book You and Your Adult Child came to be. Um, I, I wish I could say it was my brilliant idea, but it wasn't. Um, it, it was the idea of an association called AARP, which stands for the American Association of Retired Persons. Um, it, it Now it just goes by its initials. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an organization um, that supports and advocates for people who are 50 and older. Um, they began hearing from their members. And let me just say, they have a lot of members. They have 37 million members. They began hearing from their members that they had no idea what to do as parents of adult children and that there weren't resources out there. And they came to a publisher in, the, in New York and said, can you find somebody to write a book for parents this age, because they're very, very confused and perplexed. And that's how the book began. But I want to say something. So it was written for parents to help them understand. When I was recording the audiobook version, mm -hmm. um, I was in a studio with two people in their 20s, the producer of the audiobook and the sound engineer. And they had to listen very carefully when I was narrating it in order to make me redo sentences that didn't sound right to them. So they had to listen very, very carefully. And neither of them had read the book before. So this was the first time they they were exposed to the material. And each of them said to me, my parents have to read this book because they don't understand me. And so I think we have a situation now where there is a mutual misunderstanding. I think that parents of adult children don't really understand what their kids are going through. And I think that adult children don't really understand how this is affecting their parents' well-being and their parents' mental health. Yes, there's an absolute disconnect. So what can we do to understand each other better? Well, let's start with the parents. Um, I think, as I said before, um, if you can get rid of the when I was your age mentality, um, that will help things a lot. Mm -hmm. um, a second is to understand that this is a period of development. Now we're talking about the, the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. um, this is a period of development when people want to establish their autonomy from their parents. So not, you know, not only do we have parents who say, okay, now you're on your own. Um, we have kids who want to be on their own yeah. um, emotionally. And, you know, as we were chatting earlier, you mentioned correctly that, you know, adolescence is a phase and it has a beginning and it has an ending. And I want parents of adult children to understand that this is a phase also. And it has a beginning and it has an ending. And as, as a parent, you need to understand how important it is for your child to feel independent. Um, and I think in some families, when the young adult child is financially dependent, um, it's hard for everybody to understand that they might be psychologically independent, even though they're financially dependent. Exactly, exactly. And you know what I was thinking right now that you said emotional autonomy, that maybe sometimes our children 
need to break with us, to feel, to create the distance, at least emotionally, which is sometimes the only one that they can afford because they can't afford the financial part. Right. And how important it is as a mother or as a father to remain in your place and be ready from where they decide to come back. And and to not take it personally. Not take so it personally. I, I, you know, I think that um, you know, today's parents have been very involved in their kids' lives since their kids were infants and yeah. preschoolers and, and school children. Um, and they're not sure how involved they should be in their young adults' lives. And sometimes when they are very well-meaning um, in their involvement, their child rejects it. Yeah. And the parents feel hurt um, because they feel like I've supported you for so long now. Why are you turning on me now? Um, and I, I try to tell parents, I know this is hard to do, but don't take it personally. Absolutely. It's not It's not about you. It's about your adult child's need to feel competent and capable and able to be able to handle the demands of adulthood without, you know, mommy and daddy helping. Lawrence, like, I want to talk to you forever. Can we have a second date? Yes, we can. We I'm, can? I'm, I'm loving our conversation. Yes. I'm loving our conversation too. So let's do part two, because you know what? I need to be honest. I have not talked about adolescence enough on the show. So okay. we need to do that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's do part you, two you... very soon. Yeah. Okay. I would love it. Thank you. I'll tell everybody the name of your books. Are they in Spanish? And, you know, by any chance, do you know? Some of my books are in Spanish. Um, there's a book that uh, is called The Ten Basic Principles of Good Parenting. Um, that is in Spanish. Um, okay. We don't yet have a Spanish version of you and your adult child. And there is not one of you and your adolescent. But um, so, so w at least one of them is available in Spanish. Okay, great. Lawrence, a big kiss all the way to Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for talking. Thank to you. Us. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.